Welcome again, everyone. And as we shift into the Dharma talk, I'll say that I did read the chat over the break. And someone asked whether I had the photo of the nuns who gave me the bowl that I've been ringing. So I had shared the story that this bowl was given to me by a friend who went on a retreat to Bhutan. And I had given her some warm weather clothing to wear at 10,000 feet. And she brought me back the bowl and the photograph of the nuns that she had bought the bowl from. I do have the bowl here. I took the photograph of the nuns to my other office about two months ago. So I don't have the photo of the nuns, though I carry their spirit. I just have the bowl. So, but thank you, whoever asked about that, so I could tell that story. So as we shift into the Dharma talk, I'm going to build on the practices that we focused on in the guided meditation of the Brahma Viharas, practices that are portals to a more spacious and benevolent beingness. And I'll keep the focus on experiential exercises and practices, because even when I used to guest teach the Wednesday evening meditation group way back in the day when we were meeting in person at Dominican, I would focus the Dharma talk on the practical experience of the practices, not so much to talk about, but to guide us in the experience of more about presencing the present moment and being aware of the awareness so that we could know what we're experiencing while we're experiencing it. So please feel free to enter your questions and comments in the chat. I will do my best to track that, especially when we get to the Q&A, and we may also use the raise hand function. If you do use the chat, then please stay focused on your own experience as you're raising your questions. Now I'll suggest another practice that reliably opens our mind and heart to a sense of awareness, of consciousness, of the vastness and the beingness that holds all of our experiences, that is the source of all of our experiences. And that is the practice of awe. Awe is certainly part of any spiritual tradition, including the Buddhist tradition. And here I will switch gears and talk about awe and lead us in practices to evoke awe from the point of view of Dacher Keltner, who's the founder and now the faculty director of the Greater Good Science Center at the University of California, Berkeley. Rick is a senior fellow at the center. I've written many articles for the Greater Good magazine. The Greater Good Science Center conducts and publishes research on the science of happiness and well-being. And Dacker and his team spent 15 years researching awe. And his recently published book, Awe, The New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life, presents eight portals to awe, which he defines as the feeling of being in the presence of something vast that transforms your understanding of the world. And it is awareness of and experience of that vastness, that transcendence, that all major spiritual traditions point to as the experience of beingness, the source of existence, and the true nature of existence. So most of these portals to opening to vastness and wonder will be very familiar to you. One of them is spending time in nature. And most of us have experienced awe, the sense of wonder and wow, and even goosebumps and chills seeing a beautiful sunset or watching a spider weave its web or seeing a flower that seemed to have blossomed overnight. The genius of Dacker's approach to awe is that it's simple, everyday things that can reliably evoke a sense of awe. The patterns of bark on a tree, the sunlight bouncing off a drop of dew, the shapes and colors and movement of our natural world, the awe that anything exists at all. Dacra says, it's hard to imagine a single thing you can do that is better for your body and mind than finding awe outdoors. 
And I've taught the Sense and Savor Walk outdoors many times at Spirit Rock, many classes and workshops to help access that sense of vastness and wonder in nature. Another portal familiar to you is what Dacker calls collective effervescence, the sense of awe and wonder that can open up when we sing with other people or dance with other people or even march in protest with other people. And we may just now be recovering that sense of collective effervescence as we emerge from the pandemic. Being with other people in a purposeful activity can open us to the larger interconnected beingness and meaningfulness of all of life. It's a portal into the sacred of all of life. And we may even experience that sense of awe at the interconnectedness of being as we sit in an intentional sangha and community of meditation. The portal I wanna focus on in this Dharma talk is what Dacker calls moral beauty. And that is what we focused on in the meditation on the Brahma Viharas, witnessing or sharing in the moral virtues of another, witnessing a moment of kindness or compassion or generosity or courage or integrity in another person opens us to the possibility of experiencing that ourselves and to the morality or virtue of the universe, so to speak that allows us to recognize and be in awe when those moments of moral beauty happen. So we can begin our exploration of moral beauty with gratitude, which the Roman philosopher Cicero considered not only the greatest of all virtues, but the parent of all the others. So as we begin to focus on gratitude, and as we did during the meditation, you can use the ABC model of being aware allowing, accepting, being with, befriending, bringing calm and compassion and clarity to a moment. When you witnessed another human being, being grateful, expressing gratitude, being thankful for the gifts and the blessings of their life, grateful for life itself. And notice what arises in you as you recall a moment of witnessing or sharing in another person's heartfelt and maybe overflowing experience of gratitude. Notice what you're experiencing in your own body in this moment of sharing in another person's experience of gratitude. Notice if your own heart opens, not only in gratitude, but in some sense of awe or wonder or awareness or appreciation of this portal to something larger, something transcendent in the moment. And no worries if not, this is a practice and it can be a lifetime practice to notice moral beauty and experience awe, a sense of the sacred or divine in life. We'll rest here for a moment. And then take a moment to remember a moment of your own gratitude for something or someone. And I recently heard Tara Brock teach the practice of gratitude as remembering someone or something that you love. 
and notice the feelings that arise. And notice if there's a sense of awesomeness about that moment. Does your own experience of gratitude and thankfulness for someone or something you love open you to something larger, something vaster, something transcendent that might change your understanding of the world or your place in life? Be aware, allowing and accepting, and we'll rest here for a moment. Our next exploration will be of generosity, considered in the Buddhist tradition as dana, the precursor of all the other virtues, all the other moral beauties. So let yourself recall a moment of witnessing another person's generosity, especially if that moment opened your mind and heart to something larger, something vaster, not just that individual person, but the life energy that flows through all of us that allowed that person to be so generous and forthcoming. Notice, be aware, allowing and accepting of any such heart opening, sometimes mind blowing opening, if that has happened for you. And linger for a moment with the vastness that that experience opened to you. And we'll rest here for a moment. Our next exploration will be of generosity and remembering a moment of true generosity on your part not calculating or strategic, but the opening of your heart to be generous and forthcoming in sharing with and honoring another person's generosity as well. 
Notice if your own experience of your generosity of giving and sharing freely opens your awareness to something larger, vaster, transcendent, and will linger here in the awareness of that moment. So we've practiced with two of the virtues or the qualities in the Buddhist tradition that are considered reliable portals to a sense of something larger, something vaster than ourselves, the sense of gratitude and the sense of generosity that can open our hearts to the interconnectedness of all beings, of something larger and more transcendent. There are two more virtues or to practice with these portals of moral beauty before we open up this talk to the Q&A. The next is courage. And this is one of the most reliable portals to awe. So you let yourself <clears throat> call to mind a moment when you witnessed courage in another person. Someone you know, someone you heard about, someone you read about, so when you watched on TV or a film, even a group of people. And as you think of this person or people and the moment of courage that you witnessed, notice what arises in your awareness. And it's true. It could be disbelief or envy or judgment. But do see if there is a moment of awe and wonder in there what human beings are capable of and that we are capable of being moved by that moment of moral beauty. And we'll rest here for a moment.
And as we've been practicing all along, now remembering a moment when your own courage actually showed up in the face of a challenging or a difficult situation or person. You experienced a strength in your own being and the courage to act on behalf of yourself or of others. And notice what arises in you as you remember this moment in yourself. Is there a moment of wonder at the mystery of something larger that allowed you or inspired you to feel and act in this way? We'll linger here in awareness of the experience for a moment or two. And the last practice for the evening, very related to courage, is integrity. The moral compass of doing what is right, even if there is a risk or a cost. So you call to mind a moment of integrity, doing the right thing that you witnessed in another person. It could be a very small moment, but notice what arises in you. As you recall this moment of integrity, this kind of moral beauty, there may be gratitude, there may be comparison, but notice if there is anything opening you to awe and wonder and the mystery. How do they do that? And resting in our awareness of our awareness, holding this moment here for a moment.
And then recall a moment when you too acted with integrity. You did the right thing because it was the right thing to do. You may view your choice differently at a later time, but at the time you were guided by something, maybe something larger than you to do this right thing. And notice what arises in you now as you recall this moment of acting with integrity. Maybe pride, maybe disbelief, maybe wonder. And we'll linger here in the awareness of this moment of acting with integrity and the wonder of that. And as we come to a close with this experiential exploration, I want to note that all of these virtues, Dacker considers pro-social, experiences or emotions or states of mind that evoke a sense of being connected to and caring about other people. And that's what the research at the Greater Good Science Center has focused on for 20 years. So that even awe, which is a portal to vastness, the transcendent, for many the sacred, is also a profound path of practice to connect us with other people, to experience and realize the interconnectedness, the inner being of all of life, all of existence, and to experience the awe <clears throat> and wonder that that evokes. So take one more moment here to reflect on your own experience of interconnectedness, interbeing, the vastness of all of existence that these practices of awe might have evoked for you. That sense of connection and belonging and interbeing.
So again, deep bows to your practice. And what we practice tonight, these experiences of moral beauty, of virtues of awe, can create an immediate shift in our sense of ourselves and our sense of well-being. And practice over time, over a lifetime, they really strengthen our sense of wonder at the vastness and the interconnectedness of all of life. So now we shift into the Q&A, and I'd like to take a moment quickly, I'm not as fast a reader as Rick, but to read through the chat and see what we are coming up with here. I'm, I'll do this as quickly as I can. I have to take some notes here. Well, I'm in a bit of awe at the generosity of your comments. Very, very much appreciated. I take that in. Um, I'll do my best here. I want to combine a response to two of the questions. And then if we have time, we can raise hands as well. Someone asked about a practice for mothers who are frazzled. And of course, any of us can be frazzled at any time. And then how do we manage our own reactivity so that we can stay in equanimity? And the practices that I've been teaching are mindfulness practices, they're reflective practices, contemplative practices, but I'll teach you a practice that is a somatic practice that comes from the mindful self-compassion protocol because we can calm down our nervous system faster than our conscious brain can come online and do that for us. So it's simply a practice of hand on the heart. And believe me, this is a the first practice I teach, clients, workshops, retreats, whatever. It's simply to put your own hand on your own heart center and to feel the warmth of your hand on your heart. And then to breathe in a sense of goodness or kindness into your heart center. And then to remember a moment of feeling loved yourself. And resting in that feeling for 30 seconds. All of that shifts the functioning of the brain out of the reactivity. It evokes the oxytocin, which is the hormone of calm and connect, of bonding and belonging. And it brings us back to a sense of equilibrium enough that our higher brain can come online again and help us remember all the practices that we have to calm down. I offer this because this tool is powerful enough to calm down a panic attack in less than a minute. So we incorporate awareness in our body with our contemplative practice to be able to manage our reactivity. There was another question about integrity. 
And if I don't answer this correctly, then please come online and ask me again. There is so much emphasis in the Buddhist tradition on integrity, and part of that is part of the Eightfold Path. When we have wise understanding or know what a wise view of what nature is and what existence is. And so part of integrity is developing that wise view to know what is wholesome and to cultivate that, to know what is unwholesome and to let go of that. And when we can begin to discern and practice discerning the wholesome in ourselves and other people and the unwholesome in ourselves and in other people, <clears throat> then we have a better chance of not being self-righteous and not being arrogant and not imposing our view on another person, but just being able to hold steady with what that sense of truth or right or skillful is and to be able to act from that. I'll also pull in, because this is difficult sometimes when we're dealing with other people, the poem from the Mindful Self-Compassion Protocol called Compassion by Miller Williams. Have compassion for everyone you meet, even if they don't want it. What is taken as ill manners or cynicism is often a sign of what no eyes have seen and what no ears have heard. You do not know what wars are going on down there where the spirit meets the bone. So we can rest in our own sense of compassion and openness to the possibility of what may, may be driving another person's suffering and then be able to respond compassionately to that. Now, if I did not answer the questions, then please let me know. Um, I don't know. There may be other questions in the chat. I don't know. Um, maybe if there are someone like Tom could read them and let me know. But also if you have a question and raise your, you know, go to the reactions button and push the raise hand, then you'll come to the top of the screen and we can try to pull you on. You have a question from Kathleen. Okay. Up top. Okay. Do I unmute? Ask to unmute. I'll ask her to unmute. Okay. Thank you. Gloria. So thank you. Thank you. Hi. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I. I'd be curious to hear you expand a little bit on being aware of our awareness. I kind of got to an intellectual place when I heard that and then kind of lost the embodiment of it. Thank you, Kathleen. It is a practice. And often we start with coming into a sense of being here, being present, and being aware of our breathing. And we know that we're breathing. And we become aware of the awareness that allows us to know we're breathing. How, how do we know we're breathing? There's an awareness that allows us to know that we're breathing. And we become aware of that awareness, that knowing. Not what is known. The breathing is what is known. And we are the knower. But the awareness is what is knowing. And we become aware of that sense of, oh yeah, there's something larger going on here. And we practice returning to that sense of awareness again and again and again, or we catch it whenever we can become aware again. So it comes with noticing when we're aware and noticing when we're not, we come back to awareness. So practicing the noticing and settling into the knowing. That's what I would suggest. You can try that and see if that works. Okay. Other questions? There's another question, Linda, from Sarah in the chat. Okay. I'm aware of my breathing, but I am also unconnected to it. What is that called? Well, it might be awareness of your disconnection. And I'm not kidding or teasing about that. If you feel disconnected from the breathing, but you're aware that you feel disconnected, you can explore 
the disconnection. What does that feel like in your body? How do you know you feel disconnected? What are the signs or the sensations in your body or in your awareness that let you know you feel disconnected? So now that sense of disconnection becomes the object of your awareness, not your breathing, but you're focusing on that with allowing, with accepting, with being with it, with befriending it bringing some compassion to the sense of not liking feeling disconnected, but that's the experience of the moment. And just softening into it of what that experience is like and what it's like to be aware of what you're experiencing. So I would suggest that. Yeah. Other questions? And I appreciate the background work, Tom. <laughs> or if someone wants to push the raise hand button. Well, here's one from Bhakti. Okay. Um, integrity is such a relative thing. Much suffering has resulted from acting from integrity and belief that a particular perspective was, quote, right, unquote, and fighting from integrity to enforce that perspective, opposing other perspectives. So I think there's a question in there somewhere. <laughs> let, me, let me see if I can do this, Bhakti. So in the relative world, uh, to use that language, relative and absolute. In the relative world, yes, we have perspectives. If we practice a lot, we know we have perspectives. We know that our perspectives change. We know that other people have perspectives different from ours and that their perspectives can change. So in the relative world, we're paying attention to the activity and patterning of our mind and knowing that we have a perspective. The power of awareness is to know we have a perspective. And then it's one of many possibilities that it can change over time. If we experience a sense of the absolute, so many words for that, the unconditioned, the unchanging, the whatever can hold everything that's transient and impermanent, then we have a sense of, oh, there's a sense of rightness or truth sense that would be more universal, not so subject to our cultural and socioeconomic and personal history um, imprints, but something that feels more universal and true eternally. So we practice our awareness to see if we can experience that sense of the unconditioned, not caught in a pattern, not caught in a perspective, knowing when we are, and then coming back to the awareness of not being caught. And then that can give us a sense of how to act with integrity that's not coming from a particular point of view or battling another person's point of view. So again, you can let me know if that was helpful or not. Mark has a question. Okay, Mark, I just asked you to unmute. There you go. Okay, um, I missed what you are supposed to think about when your hand is over your heart to calm yourself. Oh, I sort of phased out. I couldn't hear it. Right. And again, not, not so much a cognitive thinking, but just breathing in a sense of goodness or kindness, those positive emotions, they actually change how your heart is functioning. And then remembering a moment of feeling loved and cherished and Thank cared you. about. So it's more experiential. It's, it's not a cognitive thinking that's experiential thank you and that works faster than our thinking um, and one last question uh okay oh i i see ole has a question go ahead okay. okay yeah hi linda uh, hi thank hi. you for a wonderful meditation but the four brahma habaras pardon me if i mispronounced that I first saw those years ago when I read a book by the Dalai Lama. He called them the four great immeasurables because you can't have too many of them 
And that's what got me on this path. So I just wondered if you had any perspective on that one versus immeasurables versus whatever. Thank you. Okay, so we all use words to describe the indescribable. And so the four immeasurables, the heavenly abodes, the virtues, they're, they're all words for states of mind or states of being that we can cultivate, we can access, we can abide in. They're called the heavenly abodes because when we abide there and don't leave them, when we abide in a, a more steady way, in kindness, in compassion, in joy, in equanimity, when we abide there and we're not pulled off, then that's when we can open to enlightenment. So there are practices to get to those states and there's states that when we, we can reside in them steadily, they just change everything. So I agree with the Dalai Lama's words and there are many words to describe these states. You can come up with your own if you like. What's important is the practice that will get you there. Okay. So thank you all very much for this wonderfully rich evening. I'm so honored and blessed to be here. Best wishes on your practice going forward. And if you stay enjoying the Zoom room and the discussion, then blessings on that as well.